uh, thank you. I don't know how many of you were paying attention to titles, so I just wanted to uh, start with a, a confession. Uh, when Lauren was emailing me uh, desperately for a title, like we need something for the program, so hurry up already. Uh, I basically have to admit to just looking out my window And, and this is what I came up with. Um, look, this means absolutely nothing. <laughs> I didn't have my talk together, and I figured this was safe. It, it seems like it means something, but it, 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 it doesn't. <laughs> it's, it seems deep, but it isn't. <laughs> so yeah, as, as I said, I just looked out my window. Um, that happens to be a Dunkin' Donuts um, on the first floor. Um, as you can see, we have a large cup there. <laughs> this is my uh, humble office in Manhattan uh, on 6th Avenue and 14th Street. I'm on the third floor, and uh, I, that's my little um, announcement to the world. I, my office is called the Office of Paul Sayre. Uh, acronym for is OOPS. Um, and as I said, I'm above a Dunkin' Donuts. It, I guess this is important to, to mention, uh, mainly because uh, a lot of the work I'm going to show you is definitely in the context with, of how I work. And um, uh, Nicholas and Christoph had mentioned their desire to collaborate being a reaction to basically doing what I'm doing on the right here. I, I tend to have an opposite um, uh, instinct and um, doing something, things like this are, are fun and interesting, you get to travel. But you know, I always kind of, even though I'm in a wonderful place that I've never been before, I kind of still, part of me feels like I wish I was back doing this thing on the right. Even though, it, it, re, when, you look, when you look at it this way, it's, I, I find it really disturbing. <laughs> you know, I always say I like, to, you know, I like nothing better than to just have a problem to solve, close the drapes, get, hunker down in front of the computer and start working. A few years ago, my brother, who, uh, who used to work for the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, was in town uh, visiting. The circus was in town. <laughs> Um, and he had just bought a video camera, and he was sitting on the other side of the room, and I didn't know I was working, and he was videotaping me. And later in the day, he sat me down in front of the TV and showed me something very similar to this. And I just remember being shocked, very disturbed. Um, you know, I thought I was like moving mountains, and, <laughs> and, and all I'm doing is is this, <laughs> and I'm going to inflict 45 minutes of this on you, by the way. Um, onward, this is my business card, as I mentioned, I'm above a Dunkin' Donuts. The, the, um, <laughs> it's a, it, every once in a while someone says, do you design that logo? I said, no, 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 if I designed that logo, I wouldn't be above a Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I wanted to show you some of the work that I, I do while, um, while I'm in the office. I, I have gravitated over the years to designing book jackets for some reason. And um, I have been designing book jackets for about, maybe about eight years now. And um, I'm going to kind of just flip through a few here and stop occasionally. But um, I wanted to make sure that I don't do what I often do. Is sometimes I get talking about certain things and don't show enough work. So uh, this is an attempt to remedy that. Um, I really enjoy designing book jackets. It's, it's um, I always, you, you get to expose to all this amazing 
stuff that you wouldn't, I wouldn't normally be exposed to. Uh, I consider book jacket design a, a, as pure of a design challenge as I've ever really encountered. You're basically interpreting material visually and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to sum up subject matter or the spirit of something, but at the same time not give too much away and, and hopefully interest somebody and, 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 you know, make something that's memorable. And if the subject matter is always changing too. Um, you know, in this case it's a, it's a novel about a man who's obsessed with a stripper. Uh, I, I, I mentioned the humbleness of my office mainly because I, maybe 50% of my time is spent designing book jackets and anyone who do a, does a, designs a lot of book jackets for a living will tell you that you, you, it's, there's not a lot of money in publishing so um, it's, it's always important to be creative in where you get your images. The internet is really great for free porn. And again, the subject matter is always changing so drastically. It's a wonderful novel by Ben Marcus. I, thought, I figured I'd throw a cowboy in there. Very serious subject matter every once in a while. This was a this was a cover uh, for a collection of stories by Rick Moody, and this uh, this cover was actually uh, had kind of started me in a direction. I it was 1999, and um, I've been really interested in walking the line between, uh, you know, o almost crossing the line into an area where an, an idea becomes almost kind of um, well, I, I like to, to say this is influenced by the back of maybe a Corbis stock book, you know, those, those conceptual illustrations with the earth in a vice, you know, where there's, with, which actually I was looking at this stuff the other day and it's stuff is so bad it, and enough time I think has passed that it's, our, it's starting to get interesting again somehow. But um, in this case, I'm, I'm kind of playing conceptually and trying to do something with an object that, that, that changes it in a, in a way that reflects the subject matter. And this, actually, this cover actually turned into a, a series of covers for Rick Moody's books. So, uh, a pair of keys submerged in ice. Um, cocaine in the shape of a halo for a book about uh, New York drug culture. Uh, cigarettes as kind of sprouting uh, buds. This is a cover I just finished that I'm uh, very happy with uh, for a book called The, the Bill for My Father. Sometimes, as a, sometimes also as a designer, your, your, main, the, the, your main responsibility is kind of getting out of the way. Um, in this case, uh, the title is so, uh, I think just so in, interesting and compelling on its own. And th this is an interesting memoir by Bernard Cooper and, and literally he was given a, a bill from his father for his upbringing. So, you know, you don't, it's, it's kind of an easy design challenge, I guess, as long as you can convince the publisher not to put a starburst on it or... Another novel. Another one of these type of conceptual photo illustrations. This was a, a series of um, uh, short stories. And again, the idea was to, to kind of try to reflect that in some way. Um, I, can't, I can't really explain why, but, but uh, as an, someone externally from the publisher, I tend to just do the covers for some reason. I'm not really exactly sure that, why that is. Every once in a while, the concept will demand that I deal with the whole package. So this was the back cover for this book. This is a series of books for the author Chuck Klosterman. Again, you can see this conceptual kind of conceit coming through. I see everybody's familiar with Kiss. This is a, actually a great book. Um, Chuck Klosterman writes for Spin Magazine, and, and this was a, his first 
uh, book, and it was kind of an homage to uh, 80s hair metal. Um, and he was, he's re reliving his teenage years when he just wanted to rock out in North Dakota. A lot of cows out there. Strangely enough, I was able to find a quote <laughs> that actually started making sense as I started. When I found it, I was, I was actually kind of amazed. This is a, this is a quote I'm going to give you in pieces by Ray, Bra or, um, Ray Bradbury, um, the American uh, science fiction writer. And I thought it was kind of apt in terms of how I approach things. Um, I also wanted to do the obvious thing and introduce my family to you um, because I think when you start talking about your cup being filled, you start with your family. And uh, I have lately been more and more aware of influences from strange places. I consider influences from my family strange places because uh, my upbringing, I grew up in upstate New York in a small town called Binghamton, a uh, very average American town. Uh, my dad, Ken Sayre was an aerospace engineer, he's retired, and my mother was a retired occupational therapist. No art back, background really in the family, um, just a dull town. <laughs> um, when I, as soon as I possibly could, I fled to college, and I tried to find the, the most op opposite situation I possibly could, and I ended up going to Kent State University, which many of you may have heard of, uh, this was well before I went there, but um, the campus is mainly known for a, an event that happened in, in uh, 1970 where four students were shot and killed by the Ohio National Guard uh, during a Vietnam protest. And I figured, now this is a place I can, uh, I can grow and change. Um, and it's interesting, my time in school uh, it's interesting, Kent State now is not, and when I was there in the mid-80s, is not a very radical place. I don't know if it was the, that event itself that changed it, or maybe it was just the times, but um, very conservative, quiet place. In retrospect, almost like going to school in a cemetery in a weird way, because they never were really able to come to grips with what happened there. But in terms of the cup being filled and then uh, what you end up doing with it. Um, Nicholas mentioned the op-ed page. Uh, I have done um, a lot of work for the op-ed page over the years. I always really enjoy this challenge because it's, uh, for a graphic designer, you know, you put on the illustrator hat and you have to react in such a um, timely manner with these, with these pieces. You, you literally, you know, I'll get, I'll get a call from, I would get a call from Nicholas, or now the art director there, Brian Ray, and um, you need it by the end of the day. I'll also say that, you know, for a letters piece like this, you're getting paid $175 US. So unless you can do this thing in a, in a, in a couple hours, <laughs> it just doesn't make a lot of sense. This, this was a piece that accompanied letters to the editor um, after 9-11. I'm just gonna go through these quickly. <laughs> um, Zero Tolerance in New York City. This was um, after Yasser Arafat passed away. This piece ran after uh, Timothy McVeigh was executed. He was the Oklahoma City bomber. And um, you know, occasionally with the, the, the um, op-ed pieces, you can, one of the things I like about it is that you can kind of insinuate your own opinion. I'm, I'm, I'm anti-death penalty, and this is, he, was, he was injected on this date at this time, and he passed away four minutes later. And it's, a lot of the letters were basically asking what's changed. Another piece, uh, pre-invasion. Um, And, and this was a piece that ran the day after K Kerry was defeated by Bush in the election just recently. And this was kind of like what everybody was feeling, at least everyone in New York, everyone in the blue states. And again, I think my, my uh, earlier experience in college, 
is probably also spurred my desire to do things that have a, a, a social purpose. And whenever those opportunities come along, I usually take them. This was a poster that I, I was asked to design on the, the subject of tolerance. And it was uh, something that Adobe uh, was sponsoring. And they asked a uh, faculty member and a student from a design school to collaborate and do a poster on, on, on the subject. And um, my, my collaborator was Tara Catrici at, uh, from the School of Visual Arts. And uh, we, uh, we developed a new sign for tolerance. And uh, we like to say that it's very uh, similar to a, a well-known negative hand gesture. Um, but, you know, um, I, I definitely would say that if, um, you know, if when leaving today, someone cuts you off on the way home, don't get mad, just give them one of these. <laughs> and uh, see, see what happens. Uh, Nicholas uh, uh, talked a bit about please post. I'd like to say that, uh, that Christoph and Nicholas are, are frequent collaborators. I collaborate, I collaborate with them often. We're very close friends. And both of them have been very inspirational to me in different ways. Nicholas's publication, No Zone, has always been something that I had um, a lot of respect for. And he really kind of influenced me in, in, in doing a DIY publication of my own, which is called Please Post. This is the very modest, tucked in the corner um, masthead nameplate. And I'm literally inviting people to post a series of posters that come in a newspaper form. And um, like No Zone, I guess, the, the issues, and there have been three of them thus far, are kind of loosely thematic in a way. And I have a thing for UFOs for some reason. I have no idea why. Um, and so this was actually uh, right after the invasion of Iraq. So it was just really kind of interesting how um, current events can overlap with some random theme. Uh, that was one of the posters. This is another one that I basically reproduced a uh, UFO, uh, a real UFO questionnaire for uh, reporting a UFO sighting. Uh, this was taken directly from the website of Center for UFO Studies in Chicago. Highly recommend visiting. Um, I don't know how many of these they got, but <laughs> it's been redesigned, but it was, I basically took all the information off of the one that they had on the website. So. You can just imagine them getting this and scratching their heads. Um, maybe a little wishful thinking. <laughs> and um, I think this answers a lot of questions. I hope everybody's been getting as, as much out of this recent Cheney <laughs> uh, episode as we have. <laughs> Speaking of birds, I, I also teach at the School of Visual Arts, uh, and uh, I, I have been teaching a, a maybe an unusual portfolio class for seniors there, undergraduates, and um, I wanted to show you a few of the assignments that, that I've been inflicting on these guys. Um, I have really been, I've been teaching ever since graduate school at Kent State, and I have for years been trying to free myself from assigning projects that, uh, I don't know, that, that um, kind of put my, me as a teacher in a position of being a hypothetical client. You know, design a bank logo, for instance. Um, and I kind of feel like to a certain degree, well, one, it puts me in a position of being the CEO of a bank, which I clearly am not. And uh, I think that the designers end up not learning what a graphic designer actually needs to know how to do, which is problem solving. It's more about trying to find a way for it to look like a bank logo instead of solving a problem. So I try to give them real problems and avoid hypothetical problems. So this is a very, it, a, it's, it's a very um, typical type of assignment I would give them where there's meant to be tangible results. I ask them to produce a flyer, take out a phone number and a 
voice mailbox and get as many New Yorkers as you possibly could to respond to this phone number. So it's making human beings dial. And they, you know, it was amazing some of the results. Um, this was uh, one student of mine who designed a lost pigeon flyer. And, um, the, you know, the, 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 I don't know, I guess the line between vernacular design and something you would think somebody who, who is a senior at the School of Visual Arts would do, I think is, is kind of really interesting when you are trying to do something specific and strategic. Um, got a lot of calls. <laughs> and he, you know, he was, it was interesting because he was struggling with trying to make it feel like it was serious or not serious. So we got a, almost a 50% split down the middle. He had some people calling and asking why the photo wasn't clear. <laughs> Which, in class, I was like, there's just no way. But no, there was a lot of people. And you know, he, he actually had this one woman who called every single day. And I swear to God, she was serious, um, looking for Juliet. This was another fun idea. I thought, you know, um, this student got a lot of phone calls. Um, yes, this is Jack. I'm walking west on West 23rd Street, north side of the street. I suggest taking the south side of the street if you're walking. There's construction. This one was funny, too. Well, you found it funny. We were like, I, I think it's funny. I don't know. I are people going to call? This woman got thousands of phone calls. She got almost every media outlet in New York calling her the Times, the, you know, the New York, I mean, everybody, TV stations. She got a marriage proposal. <laughs> people wanted to cook dinner for her. It's just, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you learn a lot. And this is one of the things I love about teaching. It's, again, I think it's filling the cup. It's, it's I want to be able to give, but I also want to be able to get. And I always try to keep it new for me. So it's kind of a balance between being selfish about it and, and giving, I think. Uh, this is another one. Um, um, <laughs> Esteban's wife was pregnant. And they named their daughter with the help of regular New Yorkers, believe it or not. So weird. And he's, not, he's got to explain this to her in 20 years, I guess. Uh, another thing I like to do is to confront with my students with their, with their prejudice. You wouldn't normally think of a 22-year-old or so with, uh, as, as prejudice. But um, as graphic designers, especially in, in the kind of the, the greenhouse of design school, um, there's certain play, really funny places they, people don't, they don't want to go. And one thing I do is I sign them a cute poster. I ask them to design something cute. But it has to be big. And again, tangible results. It, we're wanting to elicit this kind of awe response, um, which is not easy. And it's, it's exacerbated by the fact that the students kind of don't want to go there. They keep saying, I don't want to do something bad. And it's like, well, it's cute. It's, it's not bad. It's cute. Bad is bad. Cute is cute. Cute never hurt, hurt anyone. Um, and it's interesting that that is a huge hurdle. So what I normally do, I give them a week. They have a very specific reaction they're trying to elicit from an audience. I tell them there's going to be a special guest critic coming in, an expert on cute. And they... They're like, Sagmeister? Is Sagmeister coming in? And it's my mom. I have my mom come. She, she gets dressed up, you know, not an artist, not a designer, occupational therapist. She's, uh, she's awesome. These classes are crazy. They're so good. She really just gets to the, the point of it so quickly. Um, it's astounding. And... Um, I'll never get, forget one student did a, uh, was one of the students who didn't want to go there with the cute thing. He um, designed something that was, uh, it was, it was, a, it was an, a woman's ass getting tattooed with the word cute on it. And so here's my mom looking at this thing. 
she's getting red, I'm getting red, he's getting red. You know, he'll, ne he'll never forget that. She sends them away to revise their posters and we look at them the next week. I also um, collaborate with my mother. Um, this, I was hired um, to design a, um, an illustration for Seed Magazine, which is a science magazine. And I was asked to do a piece that was in response to the, I've forgotten the doctor's name, but the Korean scientist who supposedly had cloned the first dog. It turned out it was all uh, not true. And so I called my mom and had her cross-stitch my idea. She was great. She was cheap. She was fast. <laughs> yeah, no ego. <laughs> I want to switch to my dad now, because I'm still talking about my family. Um, I didn't mention before, I have a nose cone to a Nike Ajax surface-to-air missile in my design studio. You know, what American design studio is complete without a surface-to-air missile in it? Um, and the, the, the reason I bring this up is that I had seen this thing in a, in a junk store, and uh, I called my father, who is a retired aerospace engineer, and no kidding, he was able to identify the thing over the phone, um, which I was, that was, it was equal parts being scared and being amazed at the same time. The part that's in my office is just the very tip that, with the fins that come down, and it's seven feet tall, just to give you an idea of this huge piece of metal that was filled with explosives and aimed up into the sky. Um, again with my father and again with, with um, uh, Binghamton, New York. The one good thing about Binghamton, New York is we had a really entertaining hockey team. And this was my favorite player, Rod Bloomfield from the Broom Dusters. This would have been 1974 maybe. My dad was the statistician for the Dusters. And he, uh, again, not an artist, not a designer, he took it upon himself in 1974 to design and compile the first Duster's yearbook. Now again, 1974, it's my dad, scissors, tape, typewriter, Xerox machine. And this is his layout. And I, I, had, I had forgotten about this thing um, and I was visiting home uh, last month and, or the, the couple months ago and stumbled upon it again. I, it was kind of a revelation to me. My favorite part of, I haven't seen this thing in years, but my, one of my favorite parts of the book is he collected every single piece of writing that was done in the media on the dusters in their first season. And he did, did these, this crazy 100 page collage, uh, again with tape and scissors. You know, when, when he needed some room, he just cut into the photo, you know. You know, the quality control wasn't quite there in 1974. Things are crooked, but amazing. You know, stuff like this. <laughs> and I remember seeing it and, rem and, it, and I just totally flashed to a project that I did a few years ago for Luwaka Bop Records uh, for Jim White. And it was an, an album called No Such Place. And uh, it's eerie how similar it is. And this uh, booklet unfolded like a map from the CD, uh, the jewel case. And this was all just a collection of a lot of uh, things that Jim White brought to the table. He collects weird uh, newspaper articles. I brought on a lot of my UFO stuff. Um, but and this was painstakingly like taken off the computer Xerox 20 times and then put back on. And you know, here I'm thinking I'm doing something new and I'm basically ripping off my dad. <laughs> so badly, <laughs> really ripping him off. He was okay with it though. Um, this is, um, this is a, a, my first attempt at authoring. It's a book I co-authored called Ham, or Hello World, A Life in Ham Radio. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna have enough time to go into this, but this, this was my first attempt at, 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 at kind of traditionally authoring. Um, 
we got so much into, this is the back cover, we got so much into the, the culture of ham radio um, that I, my, my co-author Danny Gregory and I eventually got our own licenses, so now I'm KC2KHN. Um, moving on to my brother Greg. My brother's de uh, deaf, and um, he lives at home with my parents still in Binghamton. He likes to make things. One of the things he likes to make are these tissue boxes. I don't know what you call this stuff. I think it's needlepoint or something. But um, he does these really elaborate photo shoots, um, inexplicable photo shoots out in the snow. But um, he also does a lot of the sports stuff. And um, one day he showed me this, which is the uh, sign language for I love you. And I just, I was, I was so amazed at this thing. I, it just looked like a, I don't know, a gay deaf cult or something. <laughs> I had a, and you know, in, in terms of his, it, he, he, you know, I'm reacting in my kind of, I don't know, jaded New York way. And, and, and Greg's just upstate making these things with all the love he can put into it. Um, and I was so taken with that that I, I had to kind of take it and redesign it. I don't think he even knows I did this yet. But I, I did a, I hadn't mentioned, but I silk screen in my office as well. And this was a seven color silk screen. And I kind of wanted to try to make it even more disturbing somehow, or maybe even more universal, let's just say. And I had a, this was a lecture poster for a talk that I did. It was sponsored by Hallmark, so I figured <laughs> it made sense. And this is, a, this is what I'll do with my silk screen in my studio. I, as as um, I mentioned, I do lecture quite often. And um, I, I like to use that as an opportunity to do a, a poster. This was a poster called Paul Sayre, Exercises in Futility, Part 4. <laughs> this one you can't read at all. Um, I made him hang it up anyway. Here's a detail. Unless you put it in front of a really bright light, and then you get all the information and you get a rainbow as part of the deal. That's a great thing about silkscreen, you can start experimenting with, with things in a different way. This is another poster I just did, um, which was kind of based off the same, I don't know why I'm on the rainbow thing these days, but I just am, um, and the covering up and exposing. But this is another one where print the black first and then print the colors over the top of it. You have pretty much absolute opaque situation, but when you put it up against the light, you, you can read it. And it says roughly, sitting in my office, thinking about outer space, no, sorry. Sitting in my office, thinking about this poster while traveling around the sun at 800,000 miles per hour. You know, what are you, gonna, what are you gonna put? You know, what are you gonna communicate that you're not communicating? So here we continue on with this quote. The trick is knowing how to tip ourselves over um, my brother Angus, uh, as I mentioned, was uh, not only had a video camera, but he, was, um, he worked for Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. He loved animals. Um, he loved elephants, he was an, uh, but not the African kind. <laughs> um, Asian elephants only. Um, and he worked for the circus for 16 or 17 years. I'd literally see him twice a year, as I said, when the circus was in town. And um, uh, this, is, um, this is kind of not a happy story. My brother passed away last year. And I bring this up because um, in the middle of probably one of the worst times of my life, um, I found a way to my, with my work to bring some meaning to this and at least maybe, maybe, maybe if you even just call it giving yourself a little bit of feeling of not being useless in a situation. Um, I, I in, in terms of feeling helpless, um, reacted the night before this, the ceremony and the burial and I went and bought um, a bunch of one shot paints and re reproduced Angus's tattoo on, uh, on the top of his casket. And this was a really weird experience, um, as you can imagine, but a really moving one for me. Um, and one that, in the middle of it, my wife and a few other friends of mine were like, don't do this, what are you, crazy? 
Um, in the end, I'm, it, it was amazing. We were let into the, the funeral parlor at 11 o'clock at night by this really skinny, creepy looking guy. You know, here's Angus's casket. I've got paints with me. Pressure's on. Christoph was talking about painting on someone's bald head. Um, Angus was in there. <laughs> and I was on. This thing is beautiful. And, I, you know, I can't explain it. I haven't painted like this in a while, but it, it really worked. And I'm weirdly proud of it. And I guess that's why I'm showing it to you. As a kid, I loved Marvel Comics. Spider-Man was my main focus, but I loved the Fantastic Four as well. And I got a call um, about six months ago from Marvel Comics asking if I was interested in designing a book called Maximum FF. The author, Walter Mosley, was uh, spearheading this project, and he had this idea of blowing up the first issue of, of, of the Fantastic Four, which was published in 1962. Here's the cover. And I said yes, immediately. And I remember calling my wife Emily the, the, the day of the, the first meeting at Marvel. And I said to her, I am five years old right now. Five years old right now, I'm going to Marvel Comics. <laughs> I've always wanted to go to Marvel Comics. Um, and if I don't get, I don't become a 40 year old by the time I get there, this is gonna be a bad meeting. I don't know if I grew up by the time I got there, but it was, a, I, it was such a funny meeting. I was, I was thinking, well, is it gonna be a bunch of people who love comic books, or is it gonna be this kind of corporate environment? Just a room full of geeks. It was so good. I brought a copy of, uh, I think it was number eight, Spider-Man number eight, and I put it on the table, and instant respect. Just a hush. <laughs> So, uh, so the idea Walter had was to take the original issue and to blow it up, maximize it. And um, that's what I, the, the idea that I, I tried to really embrace and follow. The cover was, um, um, is basically the cover of the, the comic book, Maximize. So that's the front and that's the back. And I figured the real fans of the Fantastic Four would know immediately what it was. You see the number one, and you just see enough of the logotype that you'd know what it, what it, what it was, what it referred to. And the jacket comes off, and um, the case is, is printed with a maximized logo. Although if we're going to be technical, the, uh, the Fantastic Four's the uniforms didn't exist until issue three. <laughs> and, the, and as I said, the the jacket unfolds into a huge 35 by whatever poster of the first issue, which I thought the fans would just love. You can frame it, whatever, put it on your wall. And this is the first uh, page of the book. The title is maximized and runs over three spreads. And this is uh, some of the interior of the book. It's kind of an oversized book as well. To maximize the size of things, sometimes the orientation changed. Um, you know, and it's this weird thing where you're kind of pulling apart something that, that people, a number of people hold in very high esteem and a number of people don't think it's uh, you know, worthy of being considered an art form, which I totally don't agree with. Um, I did some cropping to maximize the emphasis. And there were a number of gatefolds in, in, in it, so this panel that was maybe two or three inches wide becomes this huge whoop, gatefold. Um, so after the book was done, I was very happy with it, I was very excited. Walter was excited, Marvel was excited, we, we, um, we parted ways. And then I, every once in a while I go to, to a couple of the comic book blogs that I was familiar with to see what the reaction was to, from the fans. I want to read you a couple of the reactions to to this, um, and there, there were hundreds on this one blog when this thing was released. This is from Greg. This is the most ridiculous book I have ever seen. <laughs> this looks like some intern spent a couple days experimenting with publishing software. <laughs> the sad part is I now, I now own this hunk of poop 
because I bought it sight unseen. DJ says, I'd like an unfolded copy of the dust jacket. <laughs> there were a number of people who were pissed because the, the poster was folded. I don't know how we would have delivered it any other way. Um, and then and Scott comes to my defense and says, let me chime in here and say, I just put it down and found it fascinating. I found myself getting lost in all the little details I'd memorized as a kid, really focusing on every panel instead of rushing through my read like I do with most comics nowadays. Reminded me why I love the FF. And then Kevin comes in and says, so that, now that makes the count, those who think it's kind of cool, one. Those who disagree, 4,147. <laughs> now, there were hundreds in between, but I like this one. This was near the end of the, the the, the thing. This is by uh, Midnight Oil. Well, I got this thing yesterday in the mail and was braced for the worst. I was explaining to my wife what the problems were while we were thumbing through it. Funny thing, after about 10 minutes, the darn thing started to grow on me. Don't ask me why, because I can't explain it. I suppose the complete lack of expectations based on reactions from this board made me pro properly prepped to receive this. Of course, my wife, with her fine arts degree, thought it was cool. Of all the trades, hardcovers, and floppies I have in the house, this is the thing she gravitates to. Go figure. You know, I, I was kind of shocked at the beginning. I'm still working up there. Because um, that's usually the environment you exist in. And, and there are a lot of times as a graphic designer, I don't hear anything. You slave and work over something, and you send it out into the world, and nothing, you know? So, I mean, I guess in the end, I would prefer really violent negative <laughs> reactions to things that I'm doing than no reaction at all. So I think there's a silver lining in it. This is the rest of the quote. The trick is knowing how to tip ourselves over and let the beautiful stuff out. And again, that's by Ray Bradbury. Back to Greg's. <laughs> my collaboration with my brother. Um, so this has now become stickers, and these are circulating around New York right now. We're, we're, um, I've been committed over the last six months to spreading the love, which, I'm, which is what I'm calling this. There are patches now. It looks great on an army coat. <laughs> really looks good on an army coat. Um, there's a website that I encourage everyone to uh, to click to, spreadin, no G, the love, L U V dot com. Free buddy icons, free wallpapers. Um, you can download the, the high res art and do whatever you will with it. Um, but this has been kind of a happy obsession over the last, um, the last few months. And there's the website. So I'd just like to, to conclude by making the point maybe that I started with here, even though I didn't know I was doing it. For me, none of the, all the diversity and some of the, the, the number of things that I do really seem like the same thing. And, I, and maybe you would argue that painting, you know, a, a tattoo on your brother's coffin is a, is a lot more important, or maybe it's different than designing a book cover. But I would, I would argue against that, really, because it, it has everything to do with what you decide to do and what I decide to do with, with my time in the office, I guess. Um, and this is, again, interesting, getting back to this main point I was making earlier. Um, this really concerned me for a while. Um, you know, it's kind of like the Matrix. You're, you know, you're kind of in a room laying down when you think you're doing all these amazing things. But I think in the end, um, I'd argue it this way, in the end I think that, um, I think of these, a book cover and this painting I'm talking about are, are the same because of the process one goes through as a designer. And I guess it always kind of looks sort of like this, but always feels difficult and hard and impossible and really satisfying and really incredible when it comes right down to it. So um, in conclusion, I'd like to, to 
to thank everyone at Design in, in, in DABA for um, inviting me to come and literally and in figuratively um, fi filling my cup. Thank you very much. <laughs>